Well, welcome everybody to this book launch of the Royal Asiatic Society's anniversary reissue of James Todd's Annals and Antiquities of Rajasthan with the companion volume written by me. And all of this is co-published by the Society and Yale University Press. Now, those of you who have looked at your invitation to this book launch carefully may have noticed that there would be an author's presentation at 6.30. Now, I fear some of you may have come here hoping to hear James Todd speak. I mention this because I've received emails from the publicity department at Yale University Press, jointly addressed to me and James, with apologies for not having James's email address. Please forward. Alas, James is unable to speak tonight. Now, according to a memorial written, a memorial to him written shortly after his death in 1835, he died, and I quote, from a fit of apoplexy while visiting his London bankers on Lombard Street. Now, this is clearly a sentiment that many here have also experienced, if not quite with the same intensity as James. The same memorial also informs us, quoting again, that Todd was born in 1782, not too far from London, in Islington. Now, I had thought to include this interesting factoid in the companion volume, but a long-suffering editor who was tasked with eradicating my American spellings of many English words and the even more venal grammatical crime of the Oxford comma became exasperated with my evident lack of familiarity with even the most basic understanding of London's geography. They suggested that I might correct the author, but I did not. This is a, uh, a view uh, engraved by Alexander Hogg uh, in 1784, just two years after Todd's birth. In the 53 years between these two bookend dates, 1782 and 1835, Todd lived just short of half of his his life in India, and two-thirds of his, of his adult life there. Now, after training for a year as a surveyor at the Royal Military Academy at Woolwich, he was sent to India, age 17, in the last year of the 18th century. Initially, he was tasked with map making. These include his extensive surveys of the Mughal Canal system in the interfluvial Doab between the Jamuna and Ganges rivers. And he also produced his map of Rajasthan, the first Western style geographic representation of the region ever produced. Todd started to survey Rajasthan in 1805, and this endeavor continued without break until 1817, when he sent his first more or less complete hand-drawn draft of, of, of the map to the Marcus of Hastings in Calcutta. Throughout these dozen years, Rajasthan remained beyond the western frontier of the company of company control, and Todd, for long periods of time, was a solitary European working with teams of Indian surveyors. Perhaps unsurprisingly, given these conditions, during this time, Todd became fluent in what was called what he called the Hindustani of Delhi, what we might know, now know as, as Kariboli. And he developed an enviable level of proficiency in the languages of southern Rajasthan, especially Mewari and Haroti. Owing to his intimate knowledge of and extended experience in Western India, in 1818, Todd would be appointed the first British political agent to the Western Rajput states, making Udaipur his official residence and base of operation. Indeed, Todd had been largely responsible for bringing the kingdoms of Mewar or Udaipur, Marwar or Jodhpur, Jaisalmer, Kota, and Bundi into a subsidiary alliance with the British. Now, in addition to being a skilled surveyor and a, compliment, a competent diplomat, Todd was also an author. His magnum opus, of course, is his Annals and Antiquities of Rajasthan, which were published originally in two volumes in London in 1829 and 1832. Although Todd had been working on this book during the last 15 years while in Rajasthan, the book only achieved a publishable form 
after his return to England in 1823, the year of this society's foundation, which Todd joined immediately upon his return to England, becoming its first librarian and a major benefactor. Thus, Todd's text was in gestation for well over two decades. And with this sound precedent in mind for never finishing a project in a timely fashion behind me, I've kept the current council of the Royal Asiatic Society fretting over whether I could deliver the anniversary reissue of Todd's Annals within the confines of the society's anniversary year. But I'm happy to report that I'm good to my word, if only barely. Now, Todd's Annals and Antiquities of Rajasthan remains to this day a vital port of call for anyone interested in Rajasthan's history and culture and the early colonial encounter in India. Todd's text continues to be widely read by lay enthusiasts of the region and travelers to it. This may not come as a surprise given Todd's vivid descriptions of contemporary, then contemporary Rajasthani life and his lively prose concerning its history. Todd was an accomplished literary stylist. Now, despite its prominent place in the canon of British Orientalist writing on India, it's somewhat more surprising to find, however, that it is a text for which academics continue to express grudging, if heavily qualified, admiration. If James Mill's History of British India is a text that scholars love to hate, then James Todd's Annals and Antiquities is a text they hate to love. This admiration for Todd's text remains true in India, even in India, where Todd has not been expunged from public memory as have so many other British colonial officials. For example, the town named after Todd, or Todgar, or Fort Todd, in central Rajasthan has not been rebranded since Indian independence. And to this day, his image frequently appears in public settings, such as on contemporary wall paintings on the streets of Rajasthan. And this is an image uh, that uh, was seen in uh, southeastern Rajasthan in, in 2020 in a, in, a very small, uh, in a very small town. Todd also remains rem memorialized in the name of the Maharana of Mewar Charitable Foundation, its top award for a foreign scholar, the James Todd Award. And here's a photograph taken also in 2020 of our chief guest presenting the award to a somewhat bewildered looking foreign scholar. Now, of course, there is much to critique in Todd's writings. Even the casual modern reader will be taken aback by his tone deaf attitudes towards specific Indian communities particularly Muslims, but also Brahmins and Marathas. And he made comments about what he considered to be the proper place of women in society, both in India and in England, that are, or at least should be, considered badly outdated today. Yet despite these shortcomings, Todd's text is still read profitably by the committed academic and the curious layperson alike. A part of its enduring appeal lies in Todd's unusual determination to record, sometimes at excruciating length, richly textured empirical data. He covered such topics as the customs and festivals of Rajasthan, including an amazingly detailed description of the 10-day long Dasara festival as observed in Udaipur in 1819, which is still used by contemporary scholars in the fields of anthropology and religious studies. Uh, and this image is, uh, is, a, is a, a, a painting by the Mewari artist Choka of the first day of the Dasara festival with its iconic buffalo sacrifice, which is virtually contemporary to and highly corroborative of Todd's description of the festival. Todd also made astute observations on Rajasthan's agricultural economies, including immensely important descriptions of sugar, sugar cane cultivation, water management in the desert environment, and opium production. Again, Todd's meticulous descriptions of the political economies of opium are still widely cited in the academy, as are his critically incisive assessments of the company's involvement in the opium trade 
and its pervasive, uh, pernicious effects on local levels of addiction and public health. And this is another painting contemporary to Todd's time in Rajasthan by the artist Kavala, who Todd knew well, depicting the production and consumption of the opium poppy mixed with the juice of sugarcane. Additionally, Todd recorded a large amount of data concerning ethnobotany, caravan routes, current affairs, historical narratives deriving from his extensive translations of Rajasthan's literary epics, and his critical reflections on company policy towards the region. Now, surely the most contentious of Todd's views, which would ultimately lead to his forced retirement from company service, and a lifelong prohibition from ever returning to India was his assertion that the kingdoms of Rajasthan constituted proper nations. As nations, Todd argued that they, po that they possessed deep and traceable historical pasts, and more importantly, a self-awareness of those pasts that beneficially fostered social cohesion and political solidarities. Thus, although Todd was initially instrumental in bringing these kingdoms within the orbit of company rule, he came to experience a form of what I call buyer's remorse and spent the latter third of his life trying to reorient com company policy towards releasing these kingdoms from British dominion and returning them to a state of what he called perfect independence. Of course, Todd's articulation of Rajput nationalism was not exactly altruistic. For one, he argued that India in the past had been, and going forward should be, a region of many minute sovereignties, which importantly he imagined would be divided amongst themselves. And while he advocated a drastic scaling back of company possessions, he never envisioned the company's complete withdrawal from the subcontinent. Rather, he said that the company should retain the Bengal Diwani the Yamuna and Ganges Doab, and certain territories in South India. Now, regardless of these extensive caveats concerning the larger positive value of company rule elsewhere in India, Todd's progressive views on Rajasthan were certainly in the minority amongst company officials. Official disapproval of Todd is reflected in the fact that his annals would not be reprinted again in the Metropole for nearly a century after its first edition. Instead, it remained for a keen Indian readership to keep this text alive. For example, by the end of the 1830s, portions of Todd's text were translated in manuscript form into the Marwari language of, of northern Rajasthan. And by mid-century, Indian-owned presses, especially in Calcutta and Lucknow, would be printing the complete text in English as well as translation. Amongst the earliest of these translation is the first Urdu translation, the Tariki Rajasthan, published in 1876, which already uses as its subtitle the official moniker by which the text remains popularly known in Rajasthan today, the Tadnaman Rajasthan, or simply Tadnaman. Two separate translations into Bengali preceded the Urdu translation by some eight years while well, the first Marathi translation followed the Urdu in the ensuing decade. Such was, was its popularity in India that William Crook would finally republish an edition of Todd's Annals in London in 1920. And it, it is this edition on which most modern day English language reprints are based, that is until now. Now, as I, as I explain in greater length in my companion volume, the Crook edition was largely a hatchet job in which he reworked large portions of Todd's text with the goal of undermining Todd's authority in order to dent its popularity in India. The ubiquity of the Crook edition and its numerous offspring with their silent emendations of Todd's texts is one of the reasons why the society's new edition with it, which restores the text to its original state has become so necessary. Now, surely the principal reason why Todd's annals was taken up with such zeal in India lay in its early articulation of local nationalisms, which he felt were most fully embodied 
in the actions and sentiments of Rajasthan's dominant Rajput caste. Indian freedom fighters such as Gandhi and Nehru both read Todd's annals approvingly. And while citing Todd's arguments about Rajput nationalism, they were nevertheless able to creatively rework them onto a larger canvas of pan-Indian nationalism. In doing so, they deftly bypassed, without so much as a backward glance, Todd's own divide and rule arguments about India's many minute sovereignties. They also blithely, blithely dismissed Todd's unfavorable attitudes towards Muslims, Brahmins, and Marathas. Another alluring aspect of Todd's annals lies in that its description of Rajasthan is densely populated with named individual Indians with whom Todd frequently formed close and enduring friendships. Uh, and this is an image of a painting by the Udaipur uh, artist uh, Choka, showing Todd being greeted with evident acclaim by the Maharana, his court, and the residents of Udaipur after a two-month absence from the city while visiting Jodhpur. Throughout the annals, the reader is introduced to kings and courtiers, businessmen and administrative officials, poets, household servants, and religious adepts. Todd not only named many dozens of these individuals, but he also provided closely observed descriptive vignettes illustrating their personalities, interests, and qualities. His discussion of Rajasthan, thus, is told primarily through his relationships with then living people. These Rajasthani characters who so colorfully enliven Todd's descriptions are not simply objects of Todd's narrative, but they were also active contributors, contributors to it. Now one tends to think of authorship in the singular. So for example, Todd is, we, we would say that Todd is the author of the Annals and Antiquities of Rajasthan. However, I would like to suggest here that the Annals is truly a heteroglossic text, that is to say, a multivocal text, in which the voices of many of his Indian interlocutors are sedimented. And this is a, it's a famous picture of Todd actually taking dictation from his chief Jain informant, uh, one uh, Gyan Chandra by name, um, about whom I shall have more to say later in this presentation. Now, as one might expect, the voices of these living interlocutors populate the eventful firsthand descriptions of his journeys across Rajasthan as described in his personal narratives. Now, these personal narratives are, are diary-like travel logs that he appended to the end of each of the two volumes of his annals. However, the distinct Indian voices are also interwoven into Todd's historical narratives concerning the major kingdoms of the region. Not only did Todd often mention who provided him with manuscripts, or oral tales, or interesting information about the history of Rajasthan, but when he wrote about historical figures, he also typically did so with some reference to their living descendants with whom he discussed these pasts. Insofar as Todd frequently laid bare the conditions under which he conducted his research and gathered his information, he was actually well ahead of his time in providing a degree of what we might now call self-reflexive transparency. This inclination places Todd apart from so many other British scholar administrators of the era who tended to present their findings according to the conceit of the detached objectivity of the heroic solitary savant. Here I just contrast these two images of Todd taking dictation from Gyan Chandra with a, a virtually contemporary portrait of uh, Colin McKenzie, a uh, portrait done by Thomas Hickey, um, uh, showing uh, McKenzie turning away from his, in, uh, if, from his Indian informants, presumably to engage with his European audience. The many discernible voices contributing to Todd's annals that appear in the annals is, are one of the reasons why Todd's text is so multifarious in both its content and style of presentation. And therefore, the text pulls in many different directions. These Indian voices are also surely one of the reasons why the text has remained popular in India, especially so in Rajasthan, where they find a familiar resonance. Now, in the remainder of this presentation, I would like to briefly illustrate three modalities by which these Indian voices express themselves. 
And I refer to these as the subversive, the formative, and the diversionary. And I will illustrate these modalities via three vignettes concerning Todd's interactions with his Indian assistants and colleagues. Now, Todd had the great good fortune of employing several wonderful artists in India whose paintings, watercolors, and drawings he used to illustrate his annals. One of the artists was Patrick Waugh, the commandant of his military escort. Waugh was also a talented amateur watercolorist who was frequently given free time to sketch highly pic picturesque scenes of the landscapes and architectural monuments he encountered while in Rajasthan. Todd also hired local artists to undertake technical line drawings of these monuments. In this endeavor, these artists, these Indian artists, often worked alongside Patrick Waugh. Here are just two uh, details showing Waugh uh, and the artist Gassi, who is the most well-known of these Indian artists who worked, also worked for Todd, working side by side. Now, Gassi initially had trained in the court atelier at Udaipur, likely under the direction of Choka, the greatest Mewari artist of the era before joining Todd. Now, the society's wonderful equestrian portrait of Maharana Bhim Singh of Mewar, which can be seen in the flesh in the exhibition downstairs, was likely a collaboration between these two talented artists. Now, during Todd's residence in Udaipur, Gassi served as Todd's official artist, accompanying him wherever he traveled from, whenever he traveled from the city on his several journeys across Raj Rajasthan. And during these travels, Gassi was, attacked, was tasked with preparing architectural line drawings of monuments of note. Now, Todd's patronage of Gassi may not have been entirely nurturing and supportive, however. Todd recorded several unvarnished statements concerning Gassi's artistic skills. Apropos of Gassi's technical drawings of the 9th century Gateshwar Mahadev temple at Baroli, for instance, Todd's judgment was characteristically caustic. I quote, an outline of the temple by Gassi will give a tolerably good notion of its appearance, though none of its beauty. Unsurprisingly, Gassi reciprocated Todd's judgment in kind by producing workmanlike but generally uninspired artwork for him. As Andrew Topsfield put it, for such work, Todd expected no originality from his painter, nor did he receive it. Gassi's painting of Maharana Kumba, a copy of a painting which is in the Udaipur Palace collection is case in point. By any standard, this painting is what one might say pedestrian, but it is instructive to compare it with what is surely Gassi's greatest composition, which he did for Maharana Bhim Singh of Mewar at roughly the same time. And this is a truly a ravishing uh, painting uh, depicting uh, a, a picnic after a hunt. Curiously, it was precisely in the genre of architectural line drawings where Gassi's work for Todd occasionally did achieve a type of virtuosity irrespective of Todd's judgment about it. In part, Gassi appears to have found a creative outlet through the inclusion of veiled subaltern commentaries directed towards Todd. Take, for example, the drawing of the very, uh, uh, take, for, take, for example, the very drawing of the Baroli temple that Todd described above, or derided above. Gassi's rendering of this temple is not a straightforward transcription of the temple, despite its parent, apparently objective, squared up, and head-on point of view. Not only has Gassi taken the interlocking ornament at the base of the temple spire and turned it into an exuberantly electrified bit of op art, but he also included a peculiar transgressive fi figure climbing up the south side of the, of the spire. Now, this figure does not, does not adorn this side of the temple. A similar figure does appear on the west, west elevation of the temple rather than the south. Now, rendering of architectural, uh, of architectural ele elevations 
simultaneously from several different uh, perspectives is actually a well-known technique in Rajasthani painting. However, Gassi also makes several additional changes to the representation of this figure. This figure is no longer shown as an architectural ornament meant to hold a long wooden pole from which a banner or umbrella would be suspended over the temple spire. Instead, the climber has become a well-known character from the corpus of Rajasthani painting, appearing in numerous compositions in which an ardent lover scales a rope at night, sorry, uh, at night to enjoy a tryst uh, with his beloved while her guards sleep below unawares. By placing this night climber on the spire, Gassi appears to indicate that mischief is afoot. And indeed it was. Although Todd greatly admired the temple complex at Baroli, he was only able to spend a day there, leaving Gassi behind for the better part of a week to continue his drawings. Todd held that this complex of some eight temples, some of which were already 900 years old at the time of Todd's visit, was an example of India's golden but fallen past. And Todd described the degraded condition of the statuary in many of the temples in some detail as proof that the heroic age had indeed fled. The narrative of the fall, which became something of an ide fixed throughout Todd's annals, apparently irked Todd, uh, apparently irked Gassi, who when he drew the statuary, invariably rendered it complete and pristine. And so here I contrast uh, 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 two images, uh, two, uh, a photograph of the uh, inner sanctum of the Trimorti Temple at, at Aroli um, with this heavily damaged uh, statuary uh, with Gassi's drawing of, of the inner sanctum showing um, the Trimorti figure uh, in a complete and pristine state. Gassi's subversive visual commentaries in response to Todd remained what James Scott once called hidden transcripts, which Gassi stealthily inserted into Todd's magnum opus. They provided a non-confrontational, silent riposte to Todd, for anyone in the know to see, suggesting that the reader might question Todd's narrative without actually trying to reshape it or correct it. However, other Indian informants did attempt to make more formative interventions into Todd's representations of Rajasthan. In this regard, let us consider just one humorous but uh, well-documented vignette of how Todd's interlocutors could often attempt to creatively shape his understanding of what he encountered. In December of 1821, Todd and Patrick Waugh made an excursion to the famous rock-cut temples at Damnar in present-day Madhya Pradesh, just over the border from Rajasthan. Perhaps the most impressive of these temples was the Hindu Dharmanath temple of the eighth century, which was cut out of the living rock into a freestanding building. However, the vast majority of the remaining 50 or so temples were even older Buddhist cave complexes that were cut into the rock going underground. Todd was much impressed with these cave temples and he spent several days drawing on his training as a surveyor to produce scaled ground plans and elevations of six of the most remarkable of the caves, along with rudimentary representations of the statuary decorating them. He annotated his drawings with information provided by a local guide, who according to Todd's, Todd's notes, was a priest from the nearby Dharmanath temple. And uh, this engraving taken from a, a drawing by Patrick Waugh shows uh, the, the local guide from the Dharmanath temple uh, showing Todd and Waugh uh, uh, around the, um, the Buddhist cave complex. Now, significantly, this priest explained the iconographic program of the statuary of these caves through the lens of the story of the Mahabharata, one of the two great Sanskrit epics. For instance, in cave 13, five alternatively seated and standing Buddhas became the five Pandava brothers. Another giant statue of the Buddha in the attitude of teaching became Bhima, and a colossal reclining Buddha on his deathbed became the son of Bhima, Gatukacha. All of these Hindu figures from the Mahabharata. Now, sometime later, 
Todd shared these drawings and the associated narrative with Gyan Chandra, his longtime Jain assistant. And Gyan Chandra pointed out the egregious fallacy of the local guide's narration. However, Gyan Chandra then proceeded to re-narrate the iconography of the Buddhist statuary according to a Jain cosmology. The five Pandava brothers became the five most important Tatankars, or Jain spiritual leaders. The Buddhist stupas became anaconic shrines to Adinat, the first Jain Tatankar, and so on. So in this one instance, we see Todd's informants misleading him not once, but twice. Now, unsurprisingly, this misinformation left Todd profoundly confused about the historical relationship between Buddhism and Jainism. This confusion led Todd to state at some times that Jainism grew out of Buddhism, but at other times he stated the exact re reverse. Of course, both these affirmations are incorrect. Finally, let me relate one last way in which Todd's informants opportunistically diverted and redirected Todd's goals to achieve agendas of their own. And let me, let me do this by introducing you to a well-known painting of Todd playing a friendly game of chess with, Ramna, with Rawat Somnath Singh of Amit. This painting was affixed to a chess set that the Rawat had presented to Todd in 1818. Amit was one of the largest feudatories of Mewar. And during the second half of the 18th century, that is in the, uh, uh, the preceding uh, two generations uh, prior to Todd, it had become something of a kingdom within a kingdom, with having its own military clients, court administrators, and attributes of sovereignty. And here we see Somnath Singh who, uh, adorned by uh, um, a golden nimbus. Now, much of the Rawat's rise to prominence came at the expense of his nominal overlord, the Maharana of Mewar, from whom significant landed, landed estates and territories had been unlawfully expropriated. When Todd became political agent, he almost immediately expressed his intention to return these expropriated estates back to the Maharana. And ultimately, he was successful in this ambition. Nevertheless, the negotiations that led to this restitu restitution took a great amount of time during which Todd had to make frequent visits to the Rawat at his court. The successful end result of these negotiations produced, as Todd described it, a welling up of emotion and floods of tears from the Rawat. Now, however copious these tears were, they nevertheless were crocodile tears. For unbeknownst to Todd, Somnat Singh used the political agent's numerous appearance at his court to give the impression to his subordinates that Todd was there to support his authority, not undermine it. Copious displays of hospitality and friendly games of chess added to this understanding. And under the illusion of Todd's support, Somnath Singh was able to expropriate yet other lands from his subordinates, his kinsmen, and neighbors. And in the end, what Somnath Singh lost to the Maharana via Todd's intervention, he more than made up from his clients to how he orchestrated his face-to-face -face interactions with Todd. So things are not always exactly as they seem at first sight. Now, interestingly, in the annals, Todd also records a traditional Rajasthani parable about chess told to him by Somnath Singh's court poet. Now, this parable tells the tale of two Mughal officers immersed in a chess match while Rajput armies besiege their fort. The distracted Mughal officers dismiss that mortal danger is imminent and neglect their military duties while playing their game of chess. The leaderless citadel is thus eventually taken by the Rajputs. And when the Rajputs break into the room where the Mughal officers reside, the Mughals calmly ask to be permitted to complete their game before their execution. The Rajputs oblige the request in both its aspects. In the early 20th century, the Hindi fiction writer Premchand married this parable as related by Todd 
with Todd's own chess playing encounters with Somnath Singh of Amit to produce his famous Hindi short story, Chatranjke Kalari, The Chess Players, which would be brilliantly adapted by Satyajit Ray in his 1977 film of the same title. In this short story, Prem Chand describes how two Mughal Nawabs in Lucknow continue their daily game of chess as the dissembling East India Company progressively swallows up the kingdom of Wajid Ali Shah. Prem Chand had read the order translation of Todd. And in the various Indian voices embedded in Todd's text, Prem Chand found all the building blocks for his enduringly powerful anti-colonial critique. So in calling attention to the local voices and agendas residing in Todd's text, it's not my goal to minimize the transformations that took place in Rajasthan under company rule and crown rule, nor is it meant to advocate a simple continuity thesis as an alternative to argu arguments about cultural ruptures that were experienced in, in India during the 19th and 20th centuries. Rather, it's to suggest that the trajectories of change that a book like Todd's Annals Unleashed be located as much in ongoing political ambitions and objectives as in colonially constituted ones. Moreover, in uncovering the heterogeneous origins of colonial discourse, we are often confronted with the discordant, incongruent, and messy aspects of its formation and historical unfolding. Thanks to the interventions of Todd's Indian interlocutors, this text did not speak with one voice, and this multivocality left it open to many different uses. Now, I introduced this presentation with the somewhat fanciful suggestion that some of you may have come here hoping to hear the author speak, only to find me. However, I hope that when you read this reissue of James's Annals and Antiquities of Rajasthan, you can take pure pleasure when you unexpectedly encounter the many other Indian voices within it that equally were not his. Thank you. <laughs>